Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums... Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hi, hello, how are you? Welcome back to Rossafari Zoo News, your source of everything going on in the world of zoos, aquariums, conservation, and general animal weirdness. Y'all, since we last spoke a week ago, I have had a very weird week with uh, some some really cool moments and some, some sad moments and, and all points in between. Um, but the, the highlight of the early part of the week is that I went down to Georgetown in Washington, D.C., and uh, spent the evening hanging out at a Cheetah Conservation Fund fundraiser where Dr. Laurie Marker, you know, the uh, previous Rasafari guest and also, you know, founder of CCF, was speaking. And uh, it was really, really cool. Uh, it was like this dress up event with food and cool people. And uh, it was a really good time, y'all. Zoe and I went and we had an absolute blast. Uh, the, the coolest part of it to me was that um, from the the way it was all written up, I kind of got the impression that Dr. Marker was going to be like a keynote speaker. Roll in, roll out, maybe wave at a familiar face or two. Uh, and I actually spoke to Dion, the person who kind of made sure that the interview happened back when I interviewed Laurie, um, to see if there would be the chance for Zoe and I to say hi to Laurie at some point, uh, you know, after the event or whatever. Um, and it turned out that that was just not necessary because she was just hanging out, being a friend, being cool. She literally introduced me to different people and told them about my podcast. And it was, it was really weird hearing this famous person in the world of conservation, uh, talking about me while I was there. It was, it was really neat and a lot of fun. Um, Laurie and everyone on that team, uh, they're just, they're just good people. And I'm not going to lie, anytime I get to hobnob with these, these people in the industry who I've admired for like a long time, and now I get to be like a part of it, it's a really cool feeling, you know, it's, it's a really unique, uh, way to measure how Rossafari is doing. And I, I really love it. So yeah, that was very cool. And then the other big topic, if you uh, have been on my socials recently, at Raw Safari, uh, of course, then you know that on uh, Wednesday night, I burnt the heck out of my left hand, uh, which was especially troubling because I have a gig uh, this upcoming weekend. By the time most of you are listening to this, I will already be on a plane at the butt crack of dawn, heading from... Uh, Buffalo, New York to Salt Lake City, Utah, where I'll spend a day and then head to Nevada for a show and then head back to Salt Lake City and then back to Buffalo. The crazy life of a musician. But um, yeah, I, I, I grabbed a hot pan. I won't go into more details than that because I won't bore y'all. But um, it was not my finest moment and I was in agony. It hurt so badly. Um, I was I was in shock, uh, but I ran it under cold water and then got immediately to, um, you know, uh, uh, an emergency room situation and got my hand looked at. And I was told that it was going to be really gross and painful. And um, I would probably, even with painkillers, wake up throughout the night with it throbbing and have blisters on my hands and that some of them would crack and it was going to be a couple weeks of healing. And I was I was very upset about this and trying to figure out if I could kind of one-handed drum my way through the gig that I have coming up. And um, it was it was not my, my favorite experience ever, weirdly. Uh, but... I woke up this morning, Thursday morning, the day after that happened, and I literally looked down at my hand and I was like, oh, why are you bandaged? You don't hurt at all. And I left the bandage on until it was, you know, time to to take a look and, and you know, reapply my drugs and re-bandage and all that stuff. And y'all, my hand is basically fine. 
There's no blistering. There are none of the issues that nothing has fallen off. I'm just going to put it that way. Nothing has fallen off. I have not gotten hand leprosy. Um, but I, I, I'm I, shocked. They, they really, I know that doctors like to give you like worst case scenario situations, but uh, I really thought I was going to be in trouble. And like today, uh, I headed to Aquarium of Niagara to hang out. And during the Sea Lion show, I was like leaning on the railing with my hands, pressing up against the railing and didn't even realize until I was like, oh, I should probably be careful just in case. But like, no pain, no issues, some minor irritation in one or two spots, but like, yeah, I got off easy. I think I got away with one, y'all. So we'll see how it is in another day or two, and especially flying and if I choose to drum with it or not. But um, I'm, I'm pretty stoked to say that uh, it seems to have turned out okay. So yeah, those are my uh, personal updates. And uh, other than that, um, it is, you know, time for another episode of Rasafari Zoo News. So if this is a new thing for you, it, it is a crowdsourced uh, zoo news program. And if you're interested in helping me out, you can send me stories, either tag me in them at Rasafari on socials, at Rasafari Pod on TikTok, or email them to me, rasafaripod at gmail.com. And uh, whether I use your story or not, I will say your name at the end of the episode to thank you if you submit a story or many stories to me. Lots of you send many stories. Um, and I just want to say this is another one of those weeks where so many people submitted so many amazing stories that I just couldn't get to them all. So if you don't hear yours, that's why uh, I apologize. But I, I mean, honestly, that's that's always the case. If you ever submit a story and don't hear it, that's that's why. But this week was especially impressive. Um, thank you all for submitting. And I truly do love you all. And you may hear some of the stories next week, depending on what that week looks like, because there was a lot of really interesting stuff, especially in the uh, conservation news area. And as a matter of fact, I want to take a moment uh, in particular right up front here to thank Anya Keen, who sent me a uh, ton of super interesting stories this week. Uh, a lot of them didn't make the final cut of this episode just because, like I said, I had so many. But um, I read them all and they were truly fascinating. And I could do an episode just of what Anya sent me this week, honestly. Uh, it's super meaningful. So thank you, Anya. Thank you to everyone who submitted. You'll all hear your names at the end. But um, yeah, it's it's been a cool, cool week for, for stories, y'all. So uh, enough talking about me. Let's talk about said stories. <laughs> Two, three, four. Ow, oh, there's a funky monkey. Treat kangaroo. Or a bin to wrong. It's two news. Yeah. All right, so we're going to start off like we usually do with our births and deaths, and of course, starting with the births. Only have a, a couple to share this week, um, but I'm, I'm going to start off, since we don't have a lot of, of individual ones, by being a little naughty. And I'm going to share some news that I can't officially share. Um, but for all you red panda lovers out there, you know that birthing season is pretty much over. But uh, it turns out that at least two facilities that I know of had multiple cubs this year that they just haven't announced. Now, I can't say where, so please don't ask. And yes, that includes those of you who DM me asking for inside scoop. Y'all are troublemakers and I love y'all. But uh, in this case, I really can't share. But uh, there are at least four more red pandlets in the U.S. population than we have heard about so far. Two of them will be heading to new zoos in the coming months. So I do wonder if they will be announced at that time. Um, I'm not really sure why the zoos in question decided to hold off on announcing, uh, but they are both incredible facilities uh, that I love and respect. So I know it's nothing shady. Now, um, I did mention it's two facilities and each had a pair of pamphlets, uh, but there may be others that I don't know of, which is why I was kind of vague on the numbers at first. But the two that I know about are really great places. So uh, I'm, I'm excited for these pandas to hit the general consensus knowledge world thing that went well uh yeah but I'm, I'm excited that they're out there and joining the population so pretty cool stuff and speaking of cool stuff and births uh metro richmond zoo has announced the birth of a female baird's taper her name is sandia which means watermelon in spanish uh, now, if you don't know, uh, when tapers are born and until they mature, they have lines and dots on them that kind of make them look like watermelons. It's, it's really adorable. So, yeah, congrats to the team at Metro Richmond Zoo. 
And that brings us to the flip of the coin, where we do have a bunch of deaths to discuss this week, sadly. And we're going to start off with a really personal one for me, y'all. The North Carolina Zoo announced the passing of their male polar bear, Peyton, on October 25th. Now, Peyton was near the end of an average lifespan for a polar bear, um, and actually died while being transported from North Carolina Zoo to the Louisville Zoo uh, for a breeding recommendation. The zoo brought a grief counselor on site to help Peyton's team and the rest of the staff deal with the loss. The, the reason this one is so personal is that I recently went to the North Carolina Zoo for two interviews, including one with some of the polar bear team. Um, as part of that experience, I got to meet the bears at the zoo, and <laughs> y'all, it was an amazing experience. I have met a lot of animals, but uh, meeting polar bears was near the top of the list. It is truly hard to explain just how magical these animals are up close. Um, oh, I I cheered up when I met uh, the first one, actually. Um you know, for somebody who meets a lot of animals, that was uh, that was unexpected. But uh, yeah, uh, Peyton will be sorely missed by everyone who knew and loved him, and even by the guests who had the privilege of seeing such an incredible species in his habitat at the zoo. Popcorn Park Animal Refuge has announced the unexpected passing of Artemis, the falcon that lived at the park. Artemis had an unexpected aortic rupture occur overnight and was found dead when staff arrived the following day. Artemis had lived most of her life working at medieval times where she was constantly tethered, having never lived untethered until she got to Popcorn Park Animal Refuge. Uh, Sending love to the team at Popcorn Park during this tough time of unexpected loss and thanks to them for giving Artemis the best part of her life right up until the very end of it. Brevard Zoo has announced the passing of Gomez, a 30-year-old wrinkled hornbill who had lived at the zoo for 20 years. Gomez was known for being an impatient eater, vocalizing when not being given treats fast enough. While he will be sorely missed, his long life is a testament to the amazing work done at the Brevard Zoo. The Jacksonville Zoo has announced the unexpected passing of Yuri, a 13-year-old Komodo dragon. When Yuri started to show signs of decline, the veterinary and herpetology teams raced into action, doing exploratory surgery, performing a blood transfusion from their older Komodo dragon, and trying a variety of daily treatments. Sadly, none of them worked. At this time, the team doesn't know what happened as they are awaiting necropsy results. Hopefully those results will bring some peace to the team. The new zoo and adventure park recently said goodbye to Rajan the Snow Leopard. Rajan was 16 years old and had been dealing with renal disease for over a year. Kidney problems often affect older cats of many species, and though it can be managed for a time, eventually renal disease will mean the end for the cats that face it. Rajan was known, in scientific terms, as the bestest kitty floof, as well as the most handsomest favorite boy. He will be sorely, sorely missed. And then uh, these last two are um, kind of a different kind. Uh, We're going to talk about a couple of people who have passed away in the zoo world. The Rosamond Gifford Zoo in Syracuse, New York, has announced the passing of Ashley Shepard, their collection manager of Asian elephants. While the loss of animals is always devastating, I can't even imagine what it's like for the team there to unexpectedly lose a leader, colleague, and friend. Sending condolences to everyone at the Rosamond Gifford Zoo. And speaking of humans that we lost in the community this week, Seneca Park Zoo announced the passing of one of their zookeepers, Kevin Blakely, known to many as the Penguin Guy. Kevin was known for having an incredible connection with the penguins in his care, often getting to snuggle the birds he loved and that loved him so much. The zoo is actually hosting a fundraiser for SANCOB, an organization dedicated to penguin conservation, and you can donate to it by going to the link on their social media pages at Seneca Park Zoo. 
I cannot imagine how hard this must be for everyone at the zoo. And I'm sending love to those people and penguins who knew and loved Kevin the best. Moving on from births and deaths, our friends at the Trevor Zoo recently rehabilitated a small otter pup they were hoping to release back into the wild. However, despite their best efforts, the otter became habituated to humans and is unreleasable. As such, she will be living at the otter exhibit at the zoo, uh, where she has been named Scooter. Now, I've talked about it on episodes before, but uh, the otter exhibit at the Trevor Zoo is incredible. It is actually in the natural stream that cuts through the property, and it is huge. Uh, They do have a male otter, but the two are being kept separately right now, meaning that as the team was working to rehabilitate this baby otter and then realizing it wasn't going to work out as hoped, they also went in and modified the exhibit so that both otters can live there without sharing space at the moment. It is, however, set up for them to be able to share space down the road. Uh, That's just an amazing amount of work. Uh, I'm so proud of the team at the Trevor Zoo. And uh, frankly, I am excited to get back to the zoo at some point to see Scooter. Speaking of friends of the pod, our friends at the Greensboro Science Center have teamed up with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission to partake in freshwater mussel surveys. And when when I say muscle, I mean like 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 the animal, not like Schwarzenegger's arms. Great, great analogy, John. Uh, anyway, researchers from the Greensboro Science Center's Conservation and Research Lab went to five streams in the area and found, tagged, and released over a thousand freshwater mussels over the span of two days. Understanding this species is very important as they are an indicator species and can also filter up to 15 gallons of water per day. I really love this next story. It's really cute, and a lot of y'all sent it to me. Uh, The Denver Zoo regularly does enrichment walks with its flamingos. Uh, Keeper staff there noticed that the white-faced whistling duck that lives at the zoo, named Matt Dillon, always seemed interested in the flamingos and even tried to interact with them as they walked past his habitat. So the team did careful introductions that went very well. Introductions? Introductions? Get it? Eh? Anyway, uh, now Matt joins the flamingos on their enrichment walks where he gets to play with his flamingo friends. Now, I love this story not only because it is adorable, which it is, um, but because it shows how much care the keepers put into making Matt's life, like, just a little bit better. Despite it taking time and effort to make sure the introductions went safely and that he was trained for the walks and everything. Um, Now, like, I know that, you know, zoos do that kind of thing, but usually it's for breeding purposes or for creating a multi-species exhibit or making an animal into an ambassador or whatever. They did this just because the staff there realized that he seemed to like these flamingos and wanted to make his life even better than it already was. This is just a quality of life thing for the duck. Um, And that's just awesome. So major props to the team at the Denver Zoo for putting in the effort, taking the time and uh, making this duck's life just a little bit better. The Minnesota Zoo has announced that two orphaned northern sea otter pups that were rescued by the Alaska Sea Life Center will be joining the uh, sea otter raft there. The pups, or as I like to call them, sea otlets, are named Denali and Nuka, and uh, they are just adorable. I highly recommend checking out the Minnesota Zoo's social media pages to uh, take a gander at these little sea otlets. All right, so for this next story, which I'm actually surprised I let uh, go so low in zoo news, uh, I'm excited to tell y'all that the Staten Island Zoo has announced that they will be opening a brand new red panda habitat in the future. Now, the exhibit is currently only in its design phase, so it'll be a while before red pandas join the zoo, but uh, they're coming to Staten Island. I think that's just awesome. On a completely unrelated note, 
I will have to make my way to the Staten Island Zoo in the future because reasons. But actually, I have to say, I think it's so funny whenever I um, see like a drone shot or a flyover shot of New York City, whether it includes Staten Island or whatever, you know, um, you always see Central Park and stuff. And I always just love knowing that there are little red pandas tucked away in Central Park and in the Bronx and in Prospect Park and now soon in Staten Island and that like, you know, there's just this this little area where you can go actually a couple areas where you can go and see red pandas and sea lions on and you know all that stuff on this island that is just the insane new york city place with the bajillion people and all the craziness um every time i see one of those overhead shots i just i just have to smile knowing that the wcs zoos are there and the staten island zoo is there on staten island uh just doing the thing and and having wildlife in a place that is uh the least wild in the country at least uh when it comes to you know the wildlife that we're talking about P- possibly the most wild in in other ways but uh but i i digress um and speaking of pandas to get back on track here uh but in this case i'm actually talking about the other pandas panda bears The National Zoo has announced that their giant pandas will officially be leaving by mid-November, meaning that the final countdown is on if you want to go see them before they depart. Uh, Actually, the day after um, going to see Dr. Marker, uh, Zoe and I, along with our friend Sarah Jane, made sure that we went to the National Zoo to go say goodbye. And I have to admit, even though I knew this was coming, it was really shocking to to realize that uh that this thing that's been there since i started to fall in love with animals is not going to be there anymore you know the uh the first stuffed animal that i ever had the one that was given to me like right when i was born it was a stuffed panda bear and i've i've always had an affinity for them and as much as i have picked on them over the years because red panda and panda bear have the same panda name and you know it's a lot of fun to be goofy about that the truth is that um it's really hard to picture the uh, the National Zoo without them. As a matter of fact, um, not only uh, did our friend Sarah Jane join us, but my mother and father came down to the zoo specifically to say goodbye to the panda bears as well. It's, it's an iconic thing. They used to take me there as a kid. Uh, I hope that whatever has led to this decision in China uh, gets reversed in the future and we're able to get panda bears back in the country. Um, But yeah, you know, that era of them being at the National Zoo is almost over. And I, for one, am very glad that I got to go and say goodbye. The Phoenix Zoo uh, has announced that they will be opening Predator Passage on November 20th. The exhibit will feature African lions, Amur leopards, fennec foxes, meerkats, red river hogs, spotted hyenas, and Rupel's griffin vultures. Huge viewing windows and a 20-foot-tall predator passage tower provide incredible views of the animals from different vantage points. I cannot wait to get back to Phoenix and to go check it out. And speaking of zoos that start with the letter P, I'm so good at transitions. Anyway, uh, Prospect Park Zoo in New York City has updated the public on the situation they are facing after taking serious damage from tropical storm Ophelia. The park remains closed, though all animals and staff were safe during the storm. The zoo-wide power and heating systems were destroyed, however, so the team is working on not only restoring those systems, but also doing so in a way that will protect them from future storm damage. Uh, Yeah, so it it may take some time until Prospect Park Zoo is open again, um, but uh, they will reopen eventually and come back stronger and more prepared than ever before. And speaking of closures, the Ross Park Zoo has announced that it will be closed from October 30th through November 9th as they take down the lanterns from their Illumination for Conservation Festival, with the zoo reopening on November 10th. That's that's 11 days. Tell you what, that must have been a heck of a lot of lanterns, y'all. 
The uh, the San Antonio Zoo has announced a one million dollar gift from the Greg Kowalski family, which will be put towards the first phase of the zoo's new master plan, which includes a new entrance, state of the art gorilla habitat, and a new five hundred person capacity events center. Man, a million dollars from the Kowalski family. Uh, They are a family that has a long history in San Antonio and is known for their philanthropy. Uh, I just, I love this so much. A million bucks for a zoo, right, as they're embarking on this huge campaign to continue to improve. Very cool. On a side note, if I have any listeners who know the Kowalski family and could talk to them about my Patreon account, I wouldn't complain. Anyone? No? Okay. Anyway, moving on. Uh, I do love when zoos do sporting bets. And this year, the Phoenix Zoo and the Fort Worth Zoo had a fun wager about the World Series played between the Arizona Diamondbacks and the Texas Rangers. The zoo in the state of the losing team, in this case Phoenix, agreed to name a Diamondback rattlesnake after a player on the winning team. Texas won, and so the Phoenix Zoo was supposed to name a Diamondback after a Texas Rangers player. However, inside sources tell me that they have just named the snake in question Ranger after the team. So uh, I don't think that counts as Welshing on a bet, and I doubt that um, the Fort Worth Zoo will make a stink. But yeah, you can now go and see a Diamondback named Ranger because the Texas Rangers won the World Series. And from winners to losers, our last story in the Zoo News segment this week is about Doc Antle, a name you may remember from the Tiger King series. He has been found guilty of four felony counts of buying and conspiring to traffic endangered animals. He is banned from owning and dealing with exotic wild animals for five years, which... Seems short to me, actually, but it's better than nothing, and uh, he was also given a suspended sentence of two years per charge. Uh, Now, a suspended sentence means that Antle won't actually go to jail unless he fails to meet certain conditions set forth in the sentencing. It's mean to say, but I, I, I really hope he screws that up and ends up with his butt in jail. Um, As a side note, congrats to the team at the Oakland Zoo who were asked to assist the Virginia Attorney General's office in helping with the seizure and closure of Wilson's Wild Animal Park, one of the facilities involved in the case. The Oakland Zoo not only helped put Doc Antle behind bars, so to speak, because suspended sentence, but also has reaffirmed their commitment to help take down any other roadside zoos that allow cub petting and all of the gross things that you might have seen if you watched Tiger King. So yay, Oakland Zoo, boo roadside zoos. And that brings us to conservation, conservation, news time. Oh, yeah. All right, so the biggest conservation news story this week is the discovery of a new Asian pangolin species. A team of researchers at Yunnan University discovered the species known as Manus Mysteria, uh, which also sounds like a Marvel Comics supervillain from the 60s. Peter Parker as the amazing Spider-Man goes up against Manus Mysteria. I, I'd read it. But anyway, yeah, new pangolin species, which is is really exciting. So that's very cool. And I, I look forward to uh, kind of learning more about it down the line and, and seeing how endangered it is and, and how much uh, humans are trafficking it until we, you know, put a stop to that. But yeah, new pangolin species. Yay! It is November, and Red Panda Network is celebrating with Push-Ups for Pandas, a virtual event running the entire month of November. You set a goal for how many push-ups you want to complete in November and ask friends and family to support you. All of the funds raised will be used for uh, funding forest guardians, anti-poaching efforts, and habitat protection. There is no entry fee, and there are some awesome prizes available. So uh, check it out at redpandanetwork.org or on their socials 
at Red Panda Network. All right, so I've talked on here before about how uh, avian influenza is ravaging bird populations in general and how it can have devastating effects on birds like California condors, which are still battling extinction daily despite the intervention of humans in a major way. Well, there is an incredible story out of Arizona that I had to share about this topic and, and this species. Uh, it's about a bird that has been named Milagre, or Miracle, in Spanish. When Milagre was a newly laid egg, her mother died of avian influenza. Normally, condor parents take turns taking care of their egg, but with mom gone, Milagre's father holed up in a small space by himself, trying to tend to the egg in an area that was likely to still have influenza around there, and not taking time to get the food or water that he would need to, you know, survive? So, uh, knowing they were likely to lose the father, and also that he wouldn't be able to last long enough to hatch the egg, the Peregrine Fund stepped in and rescued the egg, which also gave the father a chance to leave his disease-ridden space and take care of himself. The team was able to grab the egg and were surprised to see movement when they candled it. They were able to care for the egg until hatch day when Milagre was piping at the center of the egg, which can lead to an unsuccessful hatching. So staff at the facility had to step in again to assist with said hatching, but uh, hey, they were successful. Milagre did not have avian influenza, uh, which is cool because a lot of hatchlings do come from the egg already infected with the disease. And uh, she has been moved in with foster parents who will raise her to be a good, healthy condor that will hopefully be a candidate for release in the future. So as the avian influenza disease has been decimating this population, with scientists estimating that it has been set back uh, at least 10 years in the recovery efforts just from one major wave of avian influenza, and with more waves expected in the future, uh, this, this one tiny miracle baby really has become a symbol of hope for the people involved in trying to save this species, which I just love so much. And uh, speaking of avian influenza, uh, they're keeping stories of it crossing over into mammals, which is like really terrifying. Uh, but so far, these stories have mostly been isolated events. Um, but some bad news, uh, lab results have confirmed that a recent mortality event in elephant seal colonies in Argentina occurred because of avian influenza. Now, this cycles back to the One Health Initiative, uh, which is something we've talked about on here before. Um, but uh, basically, it states that we all need to work together to study and understand all diseases out there because the healths of all species on the planet are interconnected. So yeah, elephant seals dying from a disease that is only supposed to affect birds is not my favorite thing in the world. But, uh, you know... Hopefully uh, we, we can figure this out soon. There are some vaccines that, that different companies are working on and stuff, and it, it is a major issue right now. So fingers, fingers crossed, y'all. And uh, while we're talking about some of the, the sadder news and conservation news, um, you know, one of my favorite things to say in this segment is people are the problem. Uh, which is true for just so much of what happens in the world of conservation. Uh, and this next story is a great example of that. So in Uganda, tourists pay between $600 and $700 to get wildlife tracking permits that allow them to track and then spend an hour with human habituated mountain gorilla families. The money goes to conservation work in the area, as well as to helping local communities near the gorilla parks. Sadly, 14 staff members of the Uganda Wildlife Authority have now been suspended on suspicion of selling fake permits and diverting the money away from conservation and into their own pockets. People in the area are reported to be unsurprised, stating that this is just the latest of many illegal activities happening at the agency. Uh, 
Um, and, you know, going back to the, the money use that I was talking about for a second, um, if anyone listening is surprised that some of the money goes to the community instead of to saving the gorillas directly, um, these are communities that are actually on the forefront of gorilla conservation and that have to change their way of life and make many sacrifices because of their proximity to the protected gorillas. So this is a way to make that financially viable for this population of humans. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see how much uh, taking care of the finances of humans around endangered animals actually really helps save endangered animals. Unless, of course, it's, um, you know, corrupt government officials uh, taking that money for themselves, which is less good. But uh, yeah, we'll end conservation news on a happier note. Um, California Governor Gavin Newsom has signed the California Ecosystem Protection Act into law. Amongst other things, this places a moratorium on the use of difacinone, a toxic rat poison that often kills mountain lions and other wildlife when they eat the dead rodents that ingest it or ingest it themselves. This is a huge win for California wildlife. And that brings us to... It's time for other news. It's time for other news. Hey, all right now, then now it's time. It's time for other news. Hey, it's a segue to the park of other news. All right, so there are some pictures online of a pure white echidna found in Tasmania. It is really gorgeous, so I highly recommend Googling that um, and taking a look. But yeah, experts say it is a super rare condition, but it does happen. Uh, because of the picture angles, it is impossible to say whether it is an albino echidna or a leucistic one, but it is definitely one of those two things and pretty darn white. So go check it out. And uh, for this next story, we turn to a new guest host on this podcast. Me, but from the past. Back when I was afraid of spiders and convinced they were all trying to kill all humans. So let's hop in my time machine and head back to pre Rasafari John. Okay, y'all, listen. Spiders are trying to kill humans. I am convinced they are amassing an arsenal of things like machine guns and flamethrowers. But now they have found a new way to attack. According to a press release from Death Valley, a motorcyclist was injured when he crashed into the back of a camper van that slammed to a halt because a tarantula was crossing the road. They have figured out our traffic patterns, y'all, and they are using them and our humanity against us, people. This is serious. Serious, I tell you. The two people driving were from Switzerland, a nice place filled with nice people. They may be studying our culture and using it to their advantage. It's the beginning of the end, people. No, wait, come back. I'm not done yet. Come back. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway... Let's move on to a cuter story, one that I didn't record in the past. All right, so after my amazing collaboration with Trainer Talks and Tales came to an end, I needed to make sure that I had some good Australian content. And actually, Daisy has uh, tagged me in multiple Zoo News stories, so yay that. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to share this one with y'all. So a missing sheep was recently found in Australia. And you may think that's not a newsworthy story, but it turns out that this sheep had been missing for five years and had taken up residence with a mob of kangaroos. The sheep, which is named Sugar, was seen and eventually taken in by Forever Friends Animal Rescue after being fostered by the kangaroos for five years. And when the rescue gave Sugar his first shearing, they removed 28 pounds of excess woolen coat. 28 pounds. Amazing. And then last but not least in other news, researchers have discovered that male fruit flies turn to alcohol when they are sexually rejected. In fact, rejected fruit flies consume, on average, more than four times the alcohol of their mated counterparts. 
I guess this puts a whole new meaning to the term barfly. Animal, animal, animal holidays. Animal, animal, animal holidays. All right, so we are in November, which is Manatee Awareness Month. And uh, moving to our days, Friday the 3rd is World Jellyfish Day, which should really just be called World Jelly Day, but uh, it it got the name wrong. Weird. Uh, Saturday the 4th is World Numbat Day and also National Bison Day, assuming that the nation that you are in is, you know, the United States. Uh, And then on Sunday the 5th, it is World Tsunami Awareness Day and also launches Polar Bear Week, which runs the entire week from the 5th through the 11th. Then on Tuesday, November 7th, it's not only Election Day in the U.S., but it is International Land Snail Day and National Hug a Bear Day. In this case, you're meant to hug a stuffed bear. Don't do anything stupid. And those are your animal holidays for the week. All right, so there you have it, folks. Another episode of Ross Safari Zoo News is done. Yay, go team. Although I got to admit, it felt a little more fun when I when I had my team with me. I miss Daisy and Tess, y'all, and I bet you guys do too. So uh, make sure that you go and follow Trainer Talks and Tales, the amazing podcast that they put on. It was very hurtful for me to see that they uh, they have another guest on uh, this, this week. But um, I guess I can't just be their forever guest. So, uh, yeah, um, no, but go check out that amazing team. And if you somehow don't know what I'm talking about with this collab, go listen to my last three episodes, as well as my episode of Trainer Talks and Tales, where I was the guest. It was a lot of fun. Uh, speaking of ways that you can support cool people, I'm a cool people, so you can support me and this podcast by going to patreon.com slash Rossafari, and for as little as $3 a month, you can help support the podcast. I'd like to say thank you to all of my patrons, especially my Red Panda level patrons, Dr. Lara Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, and Barbara Bennett. I'd also like to thank everyone who contributed stories this week, including Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley, Carrie Kirkpatrick, Kevin Williams, Elizabeth Dunlevy, Sam Stock, Lisa Clare, Jay Meredith, Kristen Khalil, Sam Evans, Emily Rockbuck, Dr. Laura Shank, Marianne Rossi, Daisy Barrett, Cassandra Ray, Ken Tryon, Kay Malinsky, Ali Malinsky, it's the Malenskis. Jacob Zinn, Chris Gross, Karen Musklau, Crystal Chapman, and Barbara Bennett. Thank you all so very much for contributing to this week's episode. And remember, friends, the words Newsy Credits Backwards. R. Steider Kiswen. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo. Adorable. I highly check uh, check out the recommend. Yeah. In fact, rejected flute fries. Flute fries. <laughs>